صل على محمد وآل محمد بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَلِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ إِنَّ فِي خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار واختلاف الليل الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا رب ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك سبحانك فقنا عذابا ما وَلِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب
إِنَّكَ لَا تُخْلِفُ الْمِيعَادِ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على رسول الله وآله الأطهار على رسول الله وآله الأطهار صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. You know the last poem was particularly powerful. Zakal Khair. I have also never heard Kumail sing before, and it's really great to experience that. Alhamdulillah. We started these programs more than a decade ago here in our community, and as the brother had mentioned. The growth in and of itself, in terms of the sheer number of people who have shown up year on year, has been quite drastic, to say the least. But one of the things that I would ask of you to think about as we're in these important nights and gatherings is to understand the purpose of being parts of moments like this is not so that we enter into them and exit in the same state upon which we had entered. But metrics of assessment as to whether or not the experiences of gatherings such as this have impacted us, if they were transformational, is that the state that we are in when we leave from them is different than what it was that we entered into them. Meaning that I'm not supposed to be the same person once I've experienced these various majadis gatherings as I was when I had first walked in. And it's an individual assessment, but communities are made up of individuals. The trajectory upon which this facet of our Islamic centrist community has grown, some of you might not be able to even recognize when you're in places such as where you're seated right now. But the initial stages of what this program endeavored to be started out with just maybe two to three nights of these nights of Muharram that we hosted some type of gathering here, done in partnership with various spaces around the city. And slowly it then started to increase from a handful of nights to maybe half of the nights to all of the nights in their entirety. We went from a place where we were blessed to have guest speakers and shiuch who graced our gatherings with their presence to having now within the service of our community an amazing man that many of you all know, Sheikh Fayaz Jafar, may Allah preserve and protect him, who started in a part-time capacity and then came on as a full-time and during his tenure here, we not only saw the immense growth of what we were able to offer to our Shia community, but also the precedent that was set from what was taking place here influenced now the development of spaces, organizations, student activities and programs on over a hundred plus campuses across the country, and it's not an exaggeration, but that's what happens with things like light, it just spreads. That when you come to commemorate in these gatherings and remember, the light of Imam Hussein salam, still shines centuries later. When you have real ethics, real value, noble intention, that's what it is that comes about through efforts like that. But the metric of success can't be limited just to numbers. The idea can't be that I'm enthralled at the fact that X number of people showed up. It's, well, what do you do with those numbers? 
And there's many of you who in these last nights, but also the last weeks, the last months, that we've sat and had conversations, myself and yourself, you and Sheikh Fayaz, us together in spaces in our communities where many of you are quite often the person of your only race, your only culture. You're the only one who professes your beliefs within many of the spaces you frequent. You see the reality of what it means to be a minority that exists in a privileged society that won't acknowledge narrative and continues to bombard with all types of validations and justifications, inequitous practice that makes you worried, will I still have my job if I say this? Will I get penalized in this way if I say this? But one sister in particular that reached out just by chance who had this experience, she was also somebody who was Shia. And we got on a Zoom and we had a conversation. And she said that I feel so alone here in New York. I work in a space where right now Islam is being demonized at the highest of levels. And I go into my office and I have to hide every part of my identity out of fear of what might happen if I was to say something in support of things that are against the norm of this company. But most of the Muslims that I know, they're also not Shia like me. And I feel that when I'm in those spaces and those gatherings, I also don't have people who understand what it's like to, in every space, feel as if I somehow have to let go of part of who I am in order to be. And that's not what we want for our Shia community here. Our entire community is stronger because of the presence of the people in this room and all of the things that we're able to accomplish through the leadership of our amazing volunteers and people like Sheikh Fayaz Jaffer. Assalamu alaikum. And when you think about young angels like this, you want to think about in nights like this, what is it that you are going to be building so that when he is sitting where you are seated now, it's going to be that much bigger. It's going to be that much more impactful. It's going to be that much more of a sense that I don't have to leave a part of myself at the door in order to be. I can simply come and not have to explain myself in order to feel accepted. Sheikh Fayaz is not here with us, which is not an easy decision that he makes. But he knows what it is that he has uniquely helped to build and establish. And he would be from amongst the first to tell you that there are so many of you that if not for you, it would not be the case. But as he's going in order to help strengthen what is being built here by sharing those things with communities elsewhere, we have to do our part to take care of what it is that we have because nobody's gonna build for us what we have to build for ourselves. I remember a young man who came to visit us during the time of Juma prayers. And I came downstairs to meet him. There was a social worker and lawyer in our community who was working with him. He was an asylum seeker. And he wouldn't cross the gates to come in past the security guard desk that all of you walked through when you came in here today. And they called me and they said, can you come downstairs? And I said, what is it that I can do to help? And they said that he knows that we told you that he's Shia. And he's worried now that if he comes upstairs, somebody is going to hurt him. And he said in his home country where he had sought refuge from, so many of his family members were targeted and killed simply because of their Shia belief. And he said he spent so many days, so many months, pretending as if he was something he was not, just to protect himself. And now he thinks, if he comes up, that all of that is going to be something that's not there anymore. 
And I said to him that we're here, you don't have to worry. When I called Sheikh Fayaz downstairs to talk to him, it was an entirely different scenario. And I share this for you for a couple of difference, but primarily to give you an insight that the way we build here is with an understanding that I have to pay for my limitations and weaknesses. As much as I love each and every one of you in this room, I know that there are certain things that I simply cannot do for you or be for you by virtue of the fact not that I don't care for you, but our leadership structure is meant to represent our community and all of its our diversity. And so when people say to me, why do you hire the people that you hire who are well known and they are invited to travel and go everywhere that they go? Because I want the best people to be in service of our community. And we have to think collectively right now in a world that is increasingly becoming more hostile to us simply because we practice Islam. Regardless of the theological, legal schools that we follow, many of you know that you sit in many spaces where people talk about how it is that we become to them either a liability or an asset based off of their choosing as to what they want to leverage us for to their own gains. And we have to start now crafting in a way that makes more sense. And so you benefit from these gatherings. You have to do your part to keep them going and help us to increase them and grow them even more. It's not an exaggeration that a decade ago there was a percentage of the number of people that are in the room right now that were there in these nights of Muharram at that time. And as you get closer to the day of Ashura, there's going to be that many more people who are in this space with you. You possess every skill set, every credential, every training. My brother Sheikh Fayaz and I, aside from what we do here, we're the co-founders and board members of a domestic violence shelter that we've started in the Bronx that does a lot of legal advocacy and counseling work. We do a lot of things together in terms of building awareness as well as raising funds for various demographics across the world and in this city. But we're doing it because we know where it is that we can come together and what it means for us to then exert our faith and belief into action. And we need all of you to be able to help us take it to the highest potential as best as we can. Because whether people like us or not, we just do what's right because it's the right thing to do. And so where you can support our Shia chaplaincy, and help to understand that it's not just about putting into a night, a gathering where we serve a meal, but you're creating space for people who are throughout this city that even if they can't be here, knowing that this exists gives them the energy and strength to keep going. You're creating something that sets institutional precedence that's replicated in different spaces around the country and is known in different parts of the world. Creating inspiration, bearing beneficial impact. We wanna be in a place where we have visionary understanding. Nobody can build for us what we have to build for ourselves. There were some people more than a decade ago who came up with the idea that maybe this is something that we should be doing here. And you are bearing the fruits of their efforts. And out of a care, out of a dignity for them, you think about what it is that you might be able to offer. I'm gonna end with just this to give you an idea of how we can set this into a place of real something concrete individually. The Qur'an speaks about a lot of different reasons as to why we were created, and one of the reasons it speaks about is istikhlaf, to be khalifa. Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. That's what it says, that we sent you to be a khalifa on the earth. And you can think about being a khalifa as a steward, a caretaker of the earth, which it is, but you're also khalifa because you're what comes next. That my 8-year-old son, Kareem, my 11-year-old daughter, Medina, they're khalaf to me. And I'm salaf to them because I'm what precedes them. And in that spirit of istikhlaf, that where what comes next, in the collective histories that you have, 
there are people in your ancestry who have experienced colonization, slavery, all kinds of hostility and conflict, struggled with so many different things. My family is from Kashmir. It's an occupied land between India and Pakistan. May Allah end the occupation that's taking place there and end the occupation taking place in Gaza and Palestine and make us a generation that witnesses a free Palestine in our lifetimes. Both of my grandfathers were six foot four tall Kashmiri Punjabi speaking men. My grandmothers were both four foot ten, and you can tell what side of the gene pool I landed on. <laughs> my father's father used to ride a bike every single day to work and then come home and make his children study under a street light because they had no electricity in their house. I visited the home that they grew up in. It was two rooms, that was it. After partition, they moved to Gwalmundi in Lahore in Pakistan. My grandfather wanted to do everything and anything that he could to get his kids to be doctors because one of the things that you could do professionally so that somebody wasn't looking down at you and telling you that your way of being was somehow backwards and break out of a colonized mindset was by becoming a doctor. And so he struggled and rode this bike every day and stayed up with them till late in the night so they could learn. My grandfathers didn't go through what they went through living under occupation, so I would sit in the middle of Manhattan living a life of ease and comfort. And your ancestors didn't go through what they went through. The family of the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon all of them, did not go through what they went through so that we would simply spend another year being moved for moments and then go back to who it was before the month started. Istikhlaf says that we're what's next. And nobody's going to build for us what we have to build for ourselves. So the way somebody struggled and sacrificed so that we could be where we are today, we have to think about what it is that we're going to be doing while we're here so we leave it a little bit better for those who come after us. Just because we have it doesn't mean we deserve it. And the way that we treat it gives us indication as to how we truly understand the role of Allah in our lives. So Allah blessed you to be able to be in a space like this with people you can sit with that you don't have to explain yourself to at any point in time. Channel with love those that you know who struggled so that you could be where you are today and allow for yourself to bring a little bit of struggle too where you can support this campaign that's gonna come back up here, share it with others, and allow for you to be a part of the process. So when these gatherings are done, you don't stop coming. We feel your presence, but we feel your absence as well. And when the time comes for us to continue to build and continue to grow food insecurity programs, clinics, shelters, pantries, various ventures and initiatives to continue to help bring benefit, you are a key ingredient in making that happen. But remember you are part of something. We sit in these nights to remember that we don't just exist as the center of anything, but there were those who stood for what is true and right years and centuries ago, and honoring them in the best ways is remembering them at the times when we have the opportunity to stand on principle as well. And our hope is, inshallah, that what we are seeking to build here endeavors to bring out the best in all of us. Please keep this space and community in your du'as and continue to be a part of what it is that we are seeking to build. Inshallah ta'ala, Allah Zawjal will accept and bless all of us. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa billahi tawfiq. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله الأحد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد 
ثم الصلاة والسلام على النجر الأعظم ونتيجة العالم أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله التيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين سيما الحجة بقية الله في الأراضين Dear brothers and sisters, Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah that we are here again tonight to commemorate the nights that we think about Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. I'm so grateful to be here, honestly, and see the works that you guys have been doing under the leadership of Imam Khalid and Imam Fayyaz. And it's, as Imam was mentioning, this is really a, a model. I mean, wherever you go, you have something to say. And I'm, alhamdulillah, I'm grateful to be here. And uh, I promise that inshallah, wherever I go, I will spread the word. And inshallah, we'll have more examples of this, not only in other universities in New York and nationwide, but inshallah, around the world. Barakat salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We started our discussions by studying the words of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam to understand some of the important keys which can contribute to leading a life full of radaya and contentment and sa'ada. The first night we talked about goal setting and then we, as Imam mentioned, that we, when we leave this setting, when we leave these 12 nights, we should be in a different status of our life. So the first night we set our goal, that what should be our goal for this Muharram and how you can make this Muharram a different Muharram. In the second night, we came up to talk about the first important key for leading a content and a life full of Sa'ada through studying the words of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, where in Dua Arafah he says, Allahumma j'al ghinaya fi nafsi. We continued the discussion to talk about why and how this modern life led all of us to seek the answers to our problems outside of ourselves instead of looking inside to find answers. We came to the second key, which was um, finding the link between shukr and positivity, and to the third key where we talked about how important it is being gratitude when you are gratitude when you have shukr to other people, how that brings you happiness. In the fourth key, we talked about our relationship with with nature, and then we talked about how important it is to reduce the speed of our life. For the fifth one, we talked about the importance of investing in experiences and skills and knowledge that we have as a way to expand our own existence instead of expanding on having more objects and more things. Because what thumbs us is not our thi the things that we have, the objects, the cars, the houses, the other things that we have, but it is our knowledge, our experiences, and our skills. 
and we went through the verses of Quran and many of the ahadith which encourages us to um, to acquire more skills and and experiences instead of things and object. Next, we talked about surrounding ourselves with family and positive people. And then we talked about the last key, number eight, which was that there is no big joy in this world. Every little thing, every big thing is just a combination of these little things that we do. So adding all of these together will create a life full of sa'ada and full of contentment to all of us, inshallah. Tonight, we start a new topic. We're going to talk about one of the spiritual disease and one of the spiritual problems that we all suffer from. It's not only that we suffer from, it's also our A'imma alayhi salam and Imam Ali alayhi salam himself suffered from. Let's say salawat, please. That problem is the following. A tasweef procrastination. Something, uh, yeah, I can see we all are suffering from it. Yes, yes. There are actually many different ahadith and du'as that our Imma alayhi was salam were coming to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and were complaining, Ya Allah, help us to overcome this. Let me go through a few of them for you to understand the importance and the danger of having this problem and this spiritual disease inside us. And then, inshallah, we're going to cover a few points that helps to recover from it or helps, I mean, not recovering, helps to have less tasbif, inshallah. The first hadith comes from, or dua comes from Imam Ali alayhi salam, where he says, Ataytuka ya Rabbi. I came to you, my Lord, ya Allah. بِدَعْفٍ مِنَ الْأَمَلِ With weakness in my action وَنَفْسٍ لِلْرَاحَةِ مُعْتَادَ And a soul that is obsessed with fun and easy. The problem that we have our, in our life, right? We're looking only for things that are fun and easy. And then he says نَفْسٍ لِلْرَاحَةِ مُعْتَادَ a, a nafs that is submissive, that is so obsessed with fun and easy things, and a soul submissive to motives of procrastination and tasweef. This is Imam Ali alayhi salam, right? He comes and complains that he is also suffering from this. In another one, he comes again to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he cries. He says, Ya Allah, help me to cry over myself, over my, my, my nafs. Why? I afnaytu, I wasted and I ruined my life with procrastination. So now, I mean, it's kind of, it feels a little bit kind of easier when you see we all are suffering from. Even Imam Ali alayhi salam was suffering from it. But at the same time, it doesn't, it's the, the, fact, the fact that he was so intentional about it and we take it so easy, I think it makes us in danger. So let's talk a little bit about what happens when we procrastinate, how our mind works when we procrastinate, and then I'm going to mention a few ahadith which helps us to overcome it, inshallah. 
The second part, which is analyzing the way that the mind of a procrastinator works, you can find it in a TED talk very easy, search for it, and it's a full one hour, uh, I'm gonna summarize it in three minutes, so you don't need to listen to all of it, and I'm gonna contextualize it with the, um, with the situation and the ahadith that, that we, the situations that we are in, and the ahadith that we got from our Imam um, to find solution for it. So, if you remember the first night, the, I think it was the third night, we were talking about all of these different, all of these different istilahat and the uh, phrases that we have. Nafs al-Ammara, Nafs al-Lawama, Ruh, Aql, all of these different things that we had. And I said, for you to make it easy for yourself, Imagine only three things. A part of you which thinks about instant gratification, a part of you which thinks about long-term benefit, and a part of you which tries to bring balance between the instant gratification, which is nafs al-ammara, and the long-term benefit, which is nafs al-lawama, or nafs al mutmainna and the third part, which and the last part, which wants to bring the benefit, the balance, which is our aql. These three. So you can put all of these different mustalahat and the phrases that you hear into these three things. Okay. Remembering that helps us to understand the mind, our mind, when we procrastinate things. Right. So. When, it, when we procrastinate things, there is one part of us. So imagine, when, when we are analyzing this, imagine one thing that you wanted to do, but you didn't. It helps you to, uh, to move forward. Imagine like a paper that you're writing and you are procrastinating it for forever and you didn't finish it. Like you're, I don't know, if you're going through a PhD program, your thesis, if you're, um, you want to change your job and you have been, and uh, you have been trying to do it, but you never came to it. You wanted to start Salat al-Layl, and you never, you never started. Like, you wanted to start working out, and you did it only for one week and left, it and, and left the program. All of these different things that you wanted to do, but you didn't do it. So normally, when you have a project like this, there is one part of you which is the aql, which is the rational decision maker, which thinks long term, which makes sense, which tries to do the hard work, right? Which sees the big picture, which sees the maslaha, and tells you, okay, start it. But as soon as you want to start, there is instant gratification part, that monkey that comes behind the wheel. Instead of that aql being behind the wheel, now you have this instant gratification part behind the wheel and wants to check, okay, let me check my email first. Okay, let me check my WhatsApp first. Let me check my Instagram first. Let me, just for one second, okay? Just really, just for one second, let me check this Instagram post. And you go this one, next one, and next one. And now you're tired, you wanna take a break. You take a break and you come back and you're like, okay, let me check it one more time. And the same thing happens, right? And this instant grat gratification uh, part goes until the deadline is very close, right? And then all of a sudden, when the deadline is close, what happens? You get this anxiety, this panic monster coming to you to finish the job. That's how normally we over estimates our ability to finish the job. So the innocent gratification overestimates our ability 
and tells us, you are able to do it in one hour, we can do it in the last minute, right? You're overestimating your ability. I know all of you are saying that's me, right? Yeah, that's me too. So we, we overestimate our ability until the last minute, and then the last minute, this um, monster, this panic monster comes off, and you want to finish the job, right? This has happened for many, many of us, almost all of us, a lot of time, and we know. But what can you do about it? What are some of the things or that we can learn from the hadith of Ahlul Bayt salam, and of course from other sources to overcome this challenge? So, recite salawat. What helps? The first thing which comes to my mind is understanding that death is the deadline. A mind that is procrastinating kind of has this illusion that time is not finite. We have time, you have time, you have time. It's as if it is clear when we gonna die. It, as, as if it is clear that, okay, my deadline is, I know my deadline. If we are honest to ourselves, we don't know our deadline. So every second could be our deadline. So adapting a perspective that views time as a finite resource, I think is the best approach to have, or a best, best thing to practice. That what is gonna be the legacy of my life? Am I gonna continue following this problem that I have, that I'm suffering from until the end of my life? Or, inshallah, after Ashura, inshallah, next year, I'm going to feel much better in overcoming this problem. Maybe having procrastination itself as a project to overcome. That's the first thing that I think helps. And again, these things doesn't come in order. The next one comes from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Zar came to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam and asked him for an advice. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him an advice that I think it's advice for all of us. We do many different things, many different things. We do this work, that work, that work, that work, and this becomes one of the reasons that we are not able to accomplish one thing that we really like to do. Prophet tells Abu Zar, Ya Abu Zar, Ij'al hammaka hamman wahida. He says, put all, divert all your attentions and ham to one thing. Then one of the problems that we have is that, again, we I talked about the problem of multitasking or multi-jobbing or multi-projecting. I think the mind, our mind is not able to do that. Our mind is not able to do that and that's why we procrastinate many of the things that we want to do or we think that we should do. If we are serious about 
what we want to do, I think it becomes, um, it makes our mind clear that, okay, this is mine, this is my ham, inshallah, I'm going to go over it and do it. The third thing that comes to my mind is, is to see, instead of seeing procrastination as a personal failing, viewing it as a test. Being it as an imtihan, as a challenge that you can overcome. Especially if you have, fail, you have been failing this a lot. I think it, seeing it as a challenge gives you a little bit more energy. That, okay, alhamdulillah, next week, my test, ya Allah, I promise that whatever I'm giving, whatever I'm promising to you, inshallah, I'll do it on time. Okay? So this becomes a challenge today instead of just seeing, um, seeing it like a, as something that I'm going to fail again. Number four is this hadith. This hadith comes from Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He says, He is talking about Ammar one of the companions of Prophet Sallallahu and he talks about one of the very important characteristics that Ammar had that many of us don't it says Kana Ammar Iza khuyira bayna amrain ikhtar ashaddahuma ala nafsihi so a procrastinator, what happens in his or her mind is that we normally go for the fun and easy part and avoid the part that is a little bit more difficult, right? So let me give you a funny example. Like whenever you want to wash dishes, right, some of us just wants to start with, I don't know, with glasses, and it's like, okay, as long as the, the glasses is done now, I'm like, we leave those very dirty pots around, and we don't want to look at it. But imagine what happens if you do it exactly the opposite way, right? Imagine if you, if you picked up these pots, right, first, and clean them. Believe me, the rest are gonna be so easy that it goes through very fast. It says, whenever Ammar was thinking that he had two options in front of him, he chose the most difficult one and he did the most difficult one first. So I start with the most difficult one. Number one, sorry, number five is the following. Recite another salawat. Muhasaba and musharata, of course, has been a term that we all hear a lot. How to do muraqaba, how to do muhasaba, and how to do musharata every day. Right? How to make ourselves accountable. But I feel what happens in muhasaba and musharata is that we blame ourselves too much. So we see that, oh my God, even today I had this problem again. And, and we blame ourselves too much during... Uh, accountability time or musharata muraqaba uh, time and we are not able to appreciate the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us right? we are not able to do that there are two different ways of training yourself or other people if I want to instill a good, positive manner in you, there are two ways that I can come forward, right? One way is that I come to you and say, with a very good tone, 
I come and say, you have my brother, my sister, you have my friend, you have these problems, right? You have these problems, try to work on them. That's one way. Another way is to, if I come to you and see you have these strengths inside you. And as soon as I understand those strengths, I try to mention them and I try to empower the strengths that you have already. I'm not mentioning any of your problems in the second approach. I am just empowering the good things that you have inside you. And automatically, when I'm empowering those good things inside you, what's going to happen? It's going to solve the problems that you had without even knowing that, right? So accountability and muraqaba and musharata doesn't mean to come to yourself and judge yourself and blame yourself all the time. I think sometimes we need to change our approach and empower the good things that we are doing. Empowering those will, inshallah, solve a lot of other problems that we have. That's number five. And number six is, of course, the good friends. Al-mar'u ala dini khalilihi. This is a hadith from Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salam. It says, Al-mar'u ala dini khalili. Deen here doesn't mean faith. It says, Al-mar'u, insan, human being, are going to follow the lifestyle of their friends. Deen here means lifestyle. So if you are with a friend who is procrastinating more, you will gonna do that. Probably the way, I mean, you don't need to separate from your friend. You mean you don't need to cut your relation. What you need is to, inshallah, work together to overcome the problem. If I want to go back to the problem, to procrastination, and... I want to tell myself, okay, I started on a project. Give me something, right? Give me an ayah. Give me a dua that becomes my tool to start overcoming procrastination. I give you this dua. I give you this ayah. You have heard this ayah from Surah Al-Isra, number 80, in different contexts. But I feel it works very good with the mind of a procrastinator. Because as a procrastinator, you need something to start, you need something in the middle, and you need something to conclude the project with. Right? And the ayah covers all three parts in, in three different sentences. We read the ayah and see how it works. Imagine you're starting a project. The ayah says, Rabbi adkhilni mudkhala sidqin wa akhrijni mukhraja sidq wa jalli min ladunka sultanan nasira. This is, Ya Allah. I want to start this, and inshallah, I want to finish it in a day or two, or whatever is the duration of the project. So the first thing that I need is honesty with myself. Sadq is honesty with myself. So as I am entering into this project, help me enter 
Duhul means when you're entering, right? Adkhalni, help me enter to this project, to this thing. Mudkhala sadqan, with full honesty. And then help me come out of it with full honesty. And the best level of honesty is honesty with yourself. Not with other people, not even with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Rabba adkhalni mudkhala sadqan wa akhrajni mukhraja sadqa. But you know what I need in the middle? In the middle, I need Sultan and Nasira. I need Sultan, somebody, a powerful Dalil guidance, which is Nasir for me. What is Nasir? Nasir means Nusra, support, which is helping me in the middle to go through it because I know myself. Five minutes down the road, I am out in my Facebook, in my Instagram, in my somewhere else. Right? So, this has been helping me a lot. It's like, okay, this ayah is here. I'm not going to go anywhere. Right? For different people, could be different verses or different du'as. But I feel this ayah captures it all. The beginning, the end, and the middle. So, let's recite it together. And inshallah, I conclude my uh, presentation tonight with this ayah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب أدخلني مدخل صدق وأخرجني مخرج صدق واجعل لي من لدنك سلطانا نسيرا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات